when three Californian school friends formed a pop-punk trio named Green Day. They had no idea that they would eventually end up as one of the biggest bands in the world. Yet the path to success has not been an easy one, particularly during the lesser-known middle years of their career. Now, it's so huge and they kind of they transcend age and generations and they sort of transcend genres as well. You know, if people like pop music or rock music, they'll often like Green Day. Green Day is a band that writes catchy, great songs. That, that belong on the radio and belong on TV and belong for people listening to. From 1995 to 2000, Green Day released a body of work that many feel has been overlooked. Insomniac, Nimrod and Warning, a series of albums that honed and developed their pop-punk sound. This film is a review of those albums and the remarkable band who created them. Prior to their first major label release, Green Day had been steadily gathering a reputation for themselves amidst the California punk scene. I was in the punk rock scene in Philadelphia uh, from 1986 on, and so when I moved out here in 1989, I jumped into the punk rock scene out here, and they just were there, and they were part of the scene. And it wasn't as if, you know, the first time I met them, they had halos around them and descended upon the musical masses from on high. They were just, you know, another band, just, you know, doing different side bands and like joining different bands. And like they had started out as sweet children. By the time I got out here, they were Green Day. It was cool. It was real refreshing because you had a lot of, a lot of bands that were doing heavy music at the time. And they had a lot of the energy that you would, that you could get out of a heavy band. But at the same time, they, they weren't, tuned down really low, nobody was screaming, and it was like they, they had a cool message about being a, a, a bored kid with a lot of angst and a lot of energy, but it was different. It was refreshing. It still was, was kind of punk rock to where it had this energy that made you want to go get in trouble, but at the same time, it, it, was, it wasn't typical to what was going on. This is Berkeley. It's a really brainy place. It's very political. Um, there, there are no rules, it's a revolutionary, and they, they're a product of that. And they really made all that anger work for them. They, they delivered anger in such an interesting way, in, in such an aggressive way, yet with a big smile on their face. It was like a smiley face going, fuck you. I mean, that's what's great about them. The first night I met uh, Billy and Mike would have been at this fiasco of a show that Trey had set up uh, for our band sometime in 1988 and I got the impression then of well more of Billy than of, of Mike as somebody that was just really uh, single-minded of, of purpose but and and kind of quiet and reserved but very self-confident at the same time Mike at that time just seemed more like a you know very kind of happy-go-lucky just having fun kind of guy but of course you know, they were both 16, they were very young, and uh, it was also, uh, they'd only been playing at punk shows for, for a few months at the time. They were, it was, a lot of it was very new to them, and I think very exciting also. A good deal of the band's early exposure took place at legendary punk venue 924 Gilman Street. 924 Gilman is a collective, all ages, youth-run space. It does punk rock shows on Friday and Saturday nights and sometimes Sunday afternoons. Not only internationally, but locally, it's been really important. It's been a really important resource for bands and for kids just to put their courage to the sticking place and get on stage, you know, and play in that band that opens and sucks. Hey, that's okay. You know, maybe next month or next year they'll be headlining because they've become good. It's kind of like that film, uh, Field of Dreams, where they say, build it and they will come. I mean, there was very little of a scene in, in the East Bay up until 1987. And we opened the club and all of a sudden just bands came out of the woodwork. And it seemed like every, every teenager around said, wow, there's a place where they'll let us play, let's have a band. And, and some of them turned out to be pretty good. I think 924 Gilman is huge. I think it's like the... Uh... It's like the cradle of punk civilization. It's one of the places that really had an ethic that you had to 
really mean it. You had to be that. You couldn't you couldn't phone it in, you couldn't be a phony because the kids would beat up on you. They would they would boo you off stage and it was trial by fire and they were equal to that. I mean they came from that and they believed in that and I think to this day, I mean Billy Joe will say he'll always be punk. I mean he's got punk tattooed on his knuckles. I mean it's something that he lives by and if there's a religion, punk is his religion even at this age. That's actually a really still to this day a, a kind of a big breeding ground for punk rock music. It's kind of where a lot of the bands get their first foray into it as far as performing in front of a crowd and performing in front of that scene. And they're a very, very uh, picky bunch of people too as far as knowing what they want and expecting that. If you, if you don't fit their image then you're probably not going to have a, a nice response to your music at that place, that's for sure. This continued exposure led to an early signing with independent label Lookout Records, through which Green Day released the two albums that preceded their smash hit Dookie, 39 Smooth and Kaplunk. Well, Lookout was still a pretty new label then, and they were didn't really quite fit the formula. They weren't quite as punk as most of what we did. Um, but I just thought the songs were so great that it, it was worth taking a chance on, and that was that. Until American Idiot, um, the, the first album was my favorite. So, I mean, I'm obviously I'm prejudiced. Um, I, I, think, I think those first two albums are among their best. You can, unfortunately, when you listen to them, you can hear the, the really, real cheapness of the production. You could hear like the warts and the mistakes and where it wasn't quite you know, perfect. You could hear when things speed up and slow down. And, it's, so it's, it's, it's really great. And then from there on, they just got better and better and better. You could tell that they really honed the songwriting craft and the musicianship a lot more, especially Trey Cool. He went from a very sloppy, amateurish drummer to one of the best ones in the world for the genre. So you could really hear the monumental growth between those two albums. The first one was recorded, I think, basically in an afternoon. And the second, they had a couple of days, but not much more. And I mean, the, the first one was $675, I think, to, to produce, and the second maybe $1,500 or $2,000. Or $2, I guess because of my, my orientation towards DIY punk rock and indie stuff, I, I never really noticed the, the weakness of the production until much later. So by that time, the, the songs and the music was really ingrained in my head. And I mean, it's long been my contention that if the if the, the music and the performance are, are good, you just don't really notice the, the production. Although remaining an underground force, Green Day were nevertheless attracting a lot of attention within punk circles, even as far away as the UK. I feel that before they became mega with Dookie, there was an interest in Green Day over here among the pop fr punk fraternity. Uh, and that basically was because Kaplunk sold quite well in America. I think it sold about 50,000 copies on a small label, Lookout. And word tends to spread in the underground fairly quickly across the world. And I think over in the UK, there was a smattering of a following for them. Fans of the band at the time never really read any interviews of them, would see old flyers or would read the odd fanzine interview. And of course, it was sort of pre-internet and pre-downloading. So really, Green, Green Day were a kind of word of mouth band. They were one of a few bands, uh, bands like Operation Ivy and NoFX who were kind of coming out of California doing something a little bit different in the genre, but with no kind of support, uh, financial support really of the major labels. So really it was word of mouth, it's very organic how Green Day's reputation spread. What was going on was a lot of punk fans, bored and fed up with what was happening on their scene at the time, looked towards Green Day and thought, they're exciting, they're a little bit different, they're a little bit edgy. And what's more important, they're underground, they're not actually hitting the mainstream the way so many grunge bands were at the time. And I think it was the interest in the underground scene that gave Green Day the first ripples of interest and enthusiasm in Britain. It would not be until their next release that Green Day truly exploded onto the worldwide musical stage. Dookie hit the shelves in 1994, catapulting the band to overnight superstardom and mainstream radio play. The time to listen to me whine about nothing and everything all at once. I am one of those melodramatic fools. New 
erotic to the bone. No time. In this day and age, it's really tough. Unless something was a, a smash hit, you know, I mean, just huge. Uh, you're not going to hear anything before that. Like, you won't hear anything from No Doubt prior to Tragic Kingdom. You know, it's out there and it's good stuff, but you're not going to hear it on the radio. Most alternative stations were college stations here in, in the U.S. I mean, and then you had K-Rock, who really did not play, you know, to hear underground music was only like on a Sunday night and that kind of thing. Rodney Bingenheimer, you know, Rodney on the Rock. But I mean, there really wasn't, the only outlet for a Green Day kerplunk was like somebody up in, you know, where they came from, up in a college station up there, or programmers that, you know, were, were college-based. I mean, there wasn't all, you gotta remember this, there was no alternative radio then. There was a lot of rock music on the radio at that time because, you know, the, the whole Seattle scene had just started to erupt, Pearl Jams and, uh, and the Nirvanas and things were still, you know, doing very big on, on, on radio. And I think that uh, when Dookie came out, it was, it was so different sounding from what they were doing that it kind of stuck out and it stuck out in a good way and really people flocked to towards them once they got an earful of, you know, Longview and Basket Case. And not to mention MTV, I think, had a lot to do with that too as far as bringing the visuals to a forefront. I mean, they've had some great videos. Basket Case was an awesome video. I think there was a point after Duke got so huge, there came that backlash of like, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's like everybody had a copy of Dookie, and then it became like, oh, well. Once that passed, Dookie became cool again. Dookie will always be cool, you know, because it's, it's, it's a great album. It's like a, it's, it's like a masterpiece in many ways. When somebody finally does break through, that's when it becomes wildly available and popular. Things like, you know, obviously music downloads and, and internet uh, accessibility has made that a lot easier and sort of made this kind of underground rumble a lot louder. But, uh, but yeah, with Green Day in particular, it wasn't until they really broke through that, that I became a fan. Like most people, um, my first song I heard was Longview. And right off the bat, they, you could tell they were obviously like a punk band, but musically there was something more there. You know, it started with like a drum beat that wasn't like a typical punk drum beat and a bass line that wasn't a typical bass line effect that, you know, when it goes to like little chords and stuff in him, like musically there was more depth to it. I think that song sort of captured a little bit of, encompassed a little bit of what everything that Green Day was, like, you know, straight up punk with an attitude but at the same time, musically, a little bit more deep. Dookie as an album is, is pretty timeless because it, it gives you an idea of, of where it came from just by the way it sounds, but the, the meaning, the songs, what they're talking about and what they're telling you about is, is something that, that a 15-year-old can relate to. It's, it's not necessarily, oh yeah, from this time, this was our problems. These are problems that people, that, that people go through as they grow. And you, you hear songs that, you know, you know, talk about sitting bored on the couch and, and masturbating. That's, that's something that, you know, I can definitely remember. So it's like, uh, shit, as long as somebody's not coming home, I'm cool. Somebody who's 15 now is, is still hoping nobody's gonna come home. Get a job, but she don't like the one she's got when masturbation's lost its fun. I think Dookie stood the test of time terribly. I think it's a dreadful record, actually, in so many different ways. It's of its time. And in a way, you can't blame a band for doing an album of its time because any album is a snapshot of where that band stands in history. But the production is very confused. They came out with a confused album that almost sold in spite of itself. And I think part of the reason it sold was a naivety. Part of the reason it sold was also, in a way, off the back of Nevermind, because of that punky attitude, and the, and the feeling was right for the time. Kurt Cobain had died in April of 94. Now, Green Day, to me, served a purpose at that point. It's like, you know, Nirvana was pretty much dust because of that. The uh, alternative movement with uh, the grunge was pretty much kind of run its course by that time.
Green Day's commercial success was a mistake, just like Nirvana's was a mistake. And then, and that always happens. It happens time and time again in the music industry. It always happens. A band that doesn't fit the formula of the day of what's going on in rock music or pop music or whatever, they stumble into a gigantic success. The success of Dookie, however, was not entirely beneficial to the band. To release the album, they had signed with major label Reprise. Many members of the hardcore punk scene accused them of selling out. This sparked an atmosphere of creative tension that many feel influenced Green Day's musical direction for the next decade. I, mean, I remember at an interview with Billy once, he told me that after Dookie, um, they I did a show up in their hometown and they were booed. I mean, like, they would go into a store and, you know, they would have these punks, these kids going, hey, fuck you, man, you you know, who are you? You guys are sellouts. And that's kind of, un, you know, it's, it's kind of always unfortunate. It's that bitter, that's that double-edged sword. Unfortunately, the younger um, music snobs and, uh, you know, underappreciated scholars are gonna say, oh, they sold out. I don't know that, you know, somebody that's not your people liking that music means you've sold out. It just means you've done something that touches everybody on an emotional level. Part of that whole scene is a code of ethics that says, you know, we're going to do it ourselves. We're not going to sell out. And in this case, you know, I would say Green Day said, yeah, you know what? We're a rock band. We want to do this. We're going to take this chance. We're going to go forward. Um, and, you know, I thought it was a really bad ethical decision. I told him that, you know, and a lot of other people told him that too, except I think most people weren't as polite as I was. I think it's really important to be honest in, in, in situations like that. And you have to say, you know what, I, I, I can't back you on that decision he made because, you know, I don't think that signing to a major label is a good idea. I think that's what a lot of uh, a lot of the punk rock people didn't understand at first. That they weren't changing their style, they weren't changing their sound, they weren't changing. They're still the same Green Day that performed there, you know, two months prior. But now they just happen to have a little bit of commercial success behind them, and uh, that turned a lot of punk rockers off for sure. Green Day also had another issue to contend with. With their eagerly awaited follow-up album expected to sell countless millions, it seemed that Dookie had become something of a cross to bear. In some ways, it was a cross to bear because once you've had a huge international hit like that, the natural thing is to do another one as soon as possible before people get bored or move on to the next band. I mean, it sounds really cynical, but that's, that's the way the music industry works, sadly. Dookie is definitely a hard act to follow. I mean, when you think of how huge it was, how big it was, uh, there were probably a lot of people that thought, OK, well, that was, that was Green Day's, you know, moment in the sun, and then it's all down, downhill from there. But um, I'm kind of glad that that wasn't the case. And in my opinion, the best was yet to come. What American Idiot did was it kind of um, elevated them to this status where they, they're never going to be forgotten, at least for the next few decades. You know, you look at bands like um, maybe a band like The Clash or The Buzzcocks, bands who influenced Green Day. You know, at the time, they were getting they were getting bad reviews, um, certain albums better than others. People tend to look back on The Clash and just see this band who existed, that had their own sound, their own sound and that produced a series of great records. I think that's how Green Day are going to be uh, you know, viewed in the future. Despite these pressures, Green Day released their new album by the end of the following year. Insomniac arrived in October 1995, reaching number two in the US charts. I know at the time that Insomniac was written and recorded, the band had been on tour for about a year off the back of Dookie, and I know that they were kind of getting a little bit burnt out and maybe a little bit jaded with this whole other world that they'd been plunged into. Um, but I think, you know, with that in mind, the record's a strong one, you know, the, the fact that they're able to go, go into a studio, get it out quite quickly. Um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it still sounds pretty decent today. Insomniac is my favourite Green Day record, probably because it's just so pissed off and frustrated and just, you know, and that's what really appeals to me. You know, I want, you know, that kind of energy, that level of energy. I know that they 
were feeling the pressure from being told that they're not a real punk band. So they went in there and tried to make a real punk album, like heavier, faster, more intense, and I think they accomplished it. album top to bottom is just non-stop brilliant and um, so I, th I think that's I think that's the best work I mean I love Dookie I think personally just subjectively Insomniac is my favorite album. Many believed that Insomniac marked a conscious decision to create a less commercial sound. I think that's a punk rock type thing I think that's that rebel spirit inside of you smartest thing now in hindsight because you know, thank God they did that. I mean, what happens if it was one of those things where it blew away like a dry fart, you know? They put out that this overblown, like they went in and, you know, did like a Be Here Now or something and took like, you know, two years and brought in all these like producers and children's choirs and all that kind of stuff. And then you ended up with this overblown mess. So I think going back to that original, and that's that punk rock spirit and that rebel spirit going back into it and saying, we'll just do it. We don't care about this big thing that's hanging over our heads that we got to follow up a diamond album we're going to go do it our way because this is the way we feel and i'm sure there's a lot of stuff going on there's a lot of inner turmoil that uh we'll never know that went on between that time people forget that if you're writing a record or you're making songs that are important to you that's what you do and so a lot of times people accept, they expect something different. They expect, oh yeah, well this, now we're going to the next level. And sometimes people lose fa the fact of this is a good record. There's good songs on here. That's, it should stand its, it, on its own. I don't think they set out with Insomniac to do anything other than make a record they wanted to at the time. This is an album that wasn't negative. It wasn't against anything. It stood for where Green Day were at that particular juncture. Everything came together in the way that it should. And I don't think bands necessarily ever to go in to deliberately do something to undermine their own success. They do what they believe is right at that particular point. Each song it, it has its own has its own like a uh, feeling to it, you know, own emotions to it, whatever. You know, tap on that particular subject. And Bill writes it down and then he, he can forget about it and go on to the next one. <laughs> well, I mean it's not like home therapy or anything like that. It's just more like I don't know, trying to just deal with yourself, you know. Consciously or unconsciously, Insomniac's less commercial slant meant that Green Day were now taking on a much darker, more confrontational edge. On the surface, you see them on TV, you know, the people that don't follow the music or look at the lyrics and they just see the MTV, they see it kind of like, oh, those guys are kind of funny. I guess that there was that, that really silly, goofy part was always there in us. For some reason, I didn't, didn't notice that, it that much, perhaps because a lot of my dealings with them were, were off stage, you know, just <laughs> hanging out socially or for business reasons, in which case they were, they were always very earnest and serious. Between touring together, the different things that they were exposed to, and also the pressure or the, um, yeah, pressure that they had been getting from their quote unquote, you know, punk legions that they weren't punk enough. I think that that's why Insomnia came out as mature, as well written, and as dark as it was. And I think it was absolutely, again, I, I, that's my favorite album. I think for me personally, that was their peak until American Idiot. As an artist, you have to have some depth, and you know, otherwise, if you're just doing the same thing over and over again, you're, you're living in stasis and working in stasis, and stasis is death. This newfound introspection also saw the band addressing their critics, particularly those who had accused them of selling out. The song, 86, was a direct reference to the distance they felt between their present state and their pre-fame days playing at Gilman Street. What brings you up? comes to mind instantly just because it's so, you know, just filled with being pissed off and depressed about not being able to go back to where you came from and to go back to that kind of nurturing place that helped build you, you know, and 
I mean, I, I'm not in the band, so I'm not going to say that's exactly what it's about, but it seems to me really clear. I mean, 86 is, you know, 86 t is the term for throwing someone out. And we do that at Gilman. It's called 86ing somebody. I think it's the backlash. I think it's their, them dealing with the backlash of feeling that they'd been abandoned by their fans. So, so they wrote a lot of fuck you songs on it, like 86. I mean, the people who abandoned them, they were just giving them the finger. It's about having the people who used to love you and support you turn their back on you. You know, it's about all these different things that really strike home, you know, and it, to anybody who's been in any kind of messed up situation, whether it's a family situation or, you know, your friends stab you in the back or your best friend sleeps with your girlfriend or whatever it is, you know, and then they come around and like, you know, invite you to their, you know, engagement party. Oh, <laughs> what the fuck? You know, it's like that kind of just level of like, wow, you really stabbed me in the back and then just poured, you know, fucking motor oil in it and just rubbed salt in it and just, you know, made it gangrenous, gangrenous and just fuck. You know, you just fucked me. I have a hard time listening to Insomniac, at least to some, some songs on there. It's just, uh, it's just too painful. I always, you know, likened it to, uh, it was Green Day's version of In Utero. You know, it was the same, I think Nirvana had the same kind of um, problem in reacting to, to their so-called instantaneous success. Um, and they, they, to me, both bands kind of produced sort of a really dark and sort of strained records in, in response to it. There's just this weird amphetamine paranoia to it. You can read the lyrics and you know that they've had a, you know, they've been partying, but their party's kind of ended and now they've got to knuckle down to business. Despite this darker edge, the band nevertheless maintained their trademark melodic and accessible sound. <laughs> There's a lot of energy in that record. There's a vibe about it which is not pressure or intensity. It's almost a band that sort of divorced completely from the success they'd had. Pushing them back in the studio almost cut them off from trying to deal with the success and the fallout from the success. So therefore they could actually be what they were, musicians, and go in and just make an album that they felt comfortable with. I gotta say, I really like uh, Walking Contradiction. And also I love the Kinks. So like, I think there's a bit of a, there's an echo of a Kinks song in there as well, which makes me love it even more. It goes back to, again to bands like the Ramones, band, bands who kind of knew what they were doing and knew what they do best and sort of consistently play to the strengths, really. I think they just continually produce and, and they do as they would. And, you know, I, I don't have any problem with that. Insomniac had my favorite, well, one of my favorite Green Day songs of all time, which is Geek Stink Breath. I love that song. And that, to me, I mean, that's just, that's just a kick-ass rock song. I love that song. I've always been a fan of Geek Stink Breath. I think that's a great, a great song. Um, you know, I honestly haven't spent as much time with that album as I have with the other ones. It, just, it personally wasn't one of my favorites of the of the band. It's still a great album, but not one of my favorites. Um, so I, yeah, I wasn't spent too much time with 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 Insomniac, but uh, Geek Stink Breath is still one of my favorite Green Day cuts, and that was on that album. Geek Stink Breath, which was the first single, um, I, I think is, is a great song. And of course, Brain Stew. Brain Stew Jaded. I mean, that was one of the ones that made it to radio. And, uh, you know, being an alter alternative station, we've always played, you know, the, cons the two songs in succession. It doesn't just say in that uh, Brain Stew. <laughs> Brain Stew's funny because it's, uh, it, it's a couple different things. First of all, it's like the same chord progression from like a Chicago song. But it's one of those songs that it's just one riff or one progression throughout the whole song. 
the vocals change, they just get heavier, they get softer, they, it's one riff. In my mind. On my own, here we go. It's the most simplistic thing you can, you know, do. But they, they make it work. And, you know, and then it goes into the faster, heavier, you know, second half. And, um, you know, again, it, which, which is really the, the punk portion of it. So it, 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 was a, it was a great answer to Dookie. Brain Stew, I never, I thought it was really interesting. I was like, wow, it's a kind of metal song. It's like a Melvin song. You know, it's like, it's just this riff and then some stuff scattered around this riff. You know, it's really cool how it goes right into the fast song right afterwards, you know, it's really hot. Um, just like, you can see like the seething pit, massive people going in big old circle, and it's just oh, awesome. I never really understood it until one day I was uh, driving, delivering bread in the morning. I was totally hungover. I like pulled over to fucking, to, to puke. You know, because I was just like, because you know, we wake up at you know, five a.m. to deliver bread, so I was just totally hungover, just feeling like crap, and I was trying to get off of work, but I was driving along, and that song came on the radio, and I was like, this is what that song is about. It was bright sunlight, people were getting up and going to work, being all cheery with their fucking coffee and their fucking showers, and all those, oh fuck them, and I felt like shit, and I was like, that's what that song's about, and it just it clicked. The overall tone of the album was matched by the cover artwork. While Dookie had featured a cartoon-like illustration, the Insomniac sleeve displayed the kaleidoscopic designs of San Francisco-based artist Winston Smith. The best part about working with Green Day was they did not say, here's what our record's about and we want to have um, you know, an, an aardvark uh, barking at the moon, and uh, we want to have, uh, you know, a mermaid uh, in a rowboat going over Niagara Falls. I mean, sometimes people do, they give you a whole laundry list of stuff. Uh, da, 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 da. So the best thing about working with uh, the Green Lads was that they said, no, just do whatever you want to do. It's your record, do the front, the back, the inside, it's all yours. Just do your which your vision, and um, and that was the most freeing thing because I didn't feel constr constricted, so I had free hand at the composition, and I think it it kind of uh, speaks for itself uh, because it's definitely a, probably about the weirdest picture I've ever made. That's I I thought about that a few times, wonder if I have anything that would top it, and I think no. It has remained for the last decade probably one of the strangest pictures I've ever seen. Um, so again, they're, by allowing me to be me and to do my own work my way, they brought out of me, um, I think, a rather inspired piece. I think that the madness in the, in the picture is just to the level of chaotic insanity that it corresponds to some of the urgency in uh, uh, Green Day's music. I've never really put too much thought into the artwork of an album, but they have, obviously. I mean, you look at an album like Dookie, and you look at the front cover of that, and how much thought went into the, the little cartoons. It was almost like a Where's Waldo book. I mean, you, there's so many little things going on. You look at it every time and see something new. I think the um, Insomniac was a little more abstract. It was a little all over the road. It was kind of... Uh, hard to explain. It's almost like a Van Gogh painting. It was just, it was, had a very interesting feel to it. This development away from more cartoonish sleeve design was something that Green Day would continue to embrace. The artwork for American Idiot, I think, is brilliant. It's um, uh, just a, a brilliant, hard-hitting design. The, the heart as a hand grenade is, um, I think, just a couple of lines there, and it gets the point across. There's no ambiguity about it, and uh, that kind of statement's overdue. There's 
a new record that's out now that has a pretty interesting, it, it almost reminds me of the Dadaist uh, angular constructionist um, um, artwork of the 1920s, the First World War, and I think it's just a silhouette of, of Bill with his hand up and a line going down like that, which I think is a really hard-hitting graphic. Insomniac managed to sell around two million copies. No mean feat for any other band, but a comparative disappointment for Green Day's record label, given the success of Dookie. Now, by definition, the very lowest numbers you'd expect to sell on a follow-up album to something like Dookie would be about two million, which is what Insomniac, the next album, did. So, in a way, it was a complete flop because it didn't even get up to five, six, seven million, which would have been what record companies were hoping would be the case, and established the band as a big art act. They were seen already in decline. Now, Insomniac, in a strange way, is a better record. The earlier Lookout records seem to have this kind of energy and sort of hunger, and there's, there's no real agenda there. It's just, it's just a sort of unknown band releasing good songs. And Dookie was sort of similar. There, was, there wasn't too much expectation, but after that, they were kind of having to kind of be Green Day, basically. Because they were selling at a level that allowed them to be profitable for the label, but was seen by Warner Brothers as now being past their commercial peak, they were almost allowed to do what they wanted. And the, the album improved because of it, because they'd become comfortable where they were, they were writing better songs, they were stretching themselves a little bit more. And the, the irony is, thank God Insomniac was a comparative failure because it gave Green Day a career. The follow-up to Insomniac would hit the shelves almost exactly two years later. Nimrod was released in October 1997. Well, I think this one is their best album, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I think it picked every style that the group had been toying with up until that time. Um, you had a little bit of the uh, pop melodicness of Dookie. You had the angrier side of uh, Insomniac. And then you had the experimental nature of what they were doing early on with Kerplunk and when they first got into it. I think this is the album where they want to be taken seriously and put a lot of effort in. So what you put in, you get out. And it didn't crack big like Dookie did, but it really did move them along the artistic arc. Nimrod was more of a collection of really good songs as opposed to as raw and new as Dookie was and as well written and well-crafted and um, intense and emotional as uh, Insomniac was. Nimrod, to me, was a collection of decent Green Day songs. I think that's probably the one record that I haven't given a fair enough chance to. And I, I say that partly because friends of mine who I respect a lot, you know, swear by it, say it's a great record. And I think that when I first started listening to it, I, I kind of was had inured myself to, to, you know, was with the fear that it might have some of the bad points that Insomniac did, and so I, I think I may have been, been too touchy about the way I listened to it. Nimrod received a mixed critical response, one of the most widespread accusations being that, at 18 tracks, it felt overlong and somewhat self-indulgent. To me, Nimrod was an album that seemed to be a band looking for a direction, I think the one thing Green Day knew is that they were no longer a pop punk band. That Dookie had defined them in that area, but they'd grown apart and away from it. And there are some bands happy to repeat the formula, for want of a better word, ad nauseum, because they're happy with where they are and they've got no ambitions to spread themselves out and challenge themselves. Green Day didn't seem to be like that. They seemed to constantly want to reach out for something new, something fresh, something vital. If, if the foundation of punk is, is not being what everybody expects you to be and not doing what you're told to do, um, then it's a great album, you know? And, and they did that. They said, this is what we want to do. We want to be self-indulgent. Self so be it. I mean, that's, you know, if that's what you want and that's who you are, then be that, you know? Don't compromise who you are because it's not popular. 
Self-indulgence is always a weird phrase because it's always used so negatively. Sometimes it can be a very positive force. And I think the positive force on Nimrod, it was it allowed Green Day to become something a little different. They're a band. They're allowed to be self-indulgent once in a while. I mean, sure, it was a lengthy album. There's a lot of cuts on it. But uh, I don't know any music consumer that would complain about having more songs than an album. This experimental style meant that Green Day were deviating from their typical sound, something which is evident on tracks such as the instrumental Last Ride In, highlighting a musical skill which many have overlooked. I think that a lot of times successful bands or bands that make a particular type of music, the, the, the talent that went into making that music, the quality of that music, I think a lot of times that does get overlooked. There are three of the best musicians, you know, and not, not limited to punk rock, just in, in music in general. They're extremely gifted musicians and, and were right from even before they formed the band. I think with Nimrod, they were definitely trying to kind of show that there's a slight, you know, there's, a, there's a bit more complexity to some of the songwriting or Billy Joe's songwriting. Um, and they do diversify by kind of um, exploring a few different sounds. When you listen to it, you also suspect that um, Billy Joe Armstrong was maybe a little bit frustrated with being kind of uh, pigeonholed as just this sort of three minute punk pop songwriter. You could always tell that there was a kind of slightly sort of more timeless streak to his songwriting. I know that he's, he's kind of listened to lots of other non-punk bands, but that was something which was never really mentioned at the time. In the 90s, there was this punk band with dyed hair. You like to spit and, you know, do the punk cliches, or that's how people saw them. Too many critics seem to judge by how many uh, you know, minor diminished seventh chords you can jam in and all in, in weird uh, time changes. Uh, and Billy can do all of that stuff in his sleep and has been able to do it since he was uh, probably 12 years old. But like most good artists, he doesn't feel a need to. He, he sticks to, you know, he, he, he has that stuff on reserve when, when, it, when it's appropriate, but mostly he just plays the songs and, and they're great the way they are. As with Insomniac, however, Nimrod did contain a good number of traditional sounding Green Day pop songs. For me, I'd be like, like this nice guys finish last. You know, it's like, that's a really Green Day kind of title and a really Green Day kind of song. The first single from the album, Nice Guys Finish Last, was basically Green Day doing what they do best, really. You know, big poppy chorus, lots of power chords. Maybe we play, I think we're putting another single for Hitching a Ride. But not Hitching a Ride. That was the first one. <laughs> nice Guys Finish, nice guys finish last. last. That's, that's the first song on Imrod, though, so it's easy to confuse. They were never really a critics band, I don't think, in the 90s. Songs on um, Nimrod, like Nice Guys Finish Last, most critics would listen to it and go, yeah, it's Green Day doing what they normally do. And if they weren't into what Green Day do, that was it, you know, it was a bad review. They were trying out a lot of concepts, they were trying out a lot of methods of songwriting. They were really pushing things forward and they wanted to see if they worked. So maybe this is just a science experiment that worked quasi-successfully, you know? but it gave them a bigger canvas which to work on, you know. I liked the album a lot. Despite the less commercial nature of the album, there was one particular song that, when released as a single, took on a hugely successful life of its own. It's not a question but a lesson learned in time It's something unpredictable But in the end is right I hope you had the time of your life sitting in a, in a pub in Notting Hill and feeling, it was a very glum day and I was feeling sorry for myself. And, um, and this song came on onto the jukebox or onto the sound system, whatever it was. 
uh, I didn't I didn't know I'd never heard it before I didn't know it was it was Green Day and, and I just it just instantly grabbed me it was just you know one of those songs that was it was a classic and I thought hang on that sounds awfully familiar and uh, that sounds awfully like a lot like Billy Joe I mean, how could how could that be time of your life it is a brilliant song and I think the thing about it that makes it brilliant is you have somebody who's giving you this song who's known for for trouble, for shenanigans, for causing trouble, for lighting stuff on fire, breaking everything, and then you get a second of vulnerability. You get a peek inside of a deeper side of something that that isn't just put out there. Time of Your Life was kind of Billy saying, okay, here I am, I'm a family guy, I have, you know, a house, I have responsibilities, I'm trying to work with this being a rock star thing and do it the right way. It really took them to a new level once that song dropped and impacted and everybody embraced it so wholeheartedly. I think it was on the season finale of Seinfeld. I mean, when you get to that level, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna open, up, open up doors that weren't there before. But in the end it's right I hope you have the time of your life I wonder now whether or not Green Day would go in and do it completely differently. Maybe with a bigger sound, a bigger orchestra, who knows? But it worked at the time because I think there was naivety and charm about the way they approached the song that also showed they were reaching out and trying to pull in other elements. It had nothing to do with punk. In fact, I would say, almost with no change in the arrangement, Celine Dion could do it. It's a, it's a great song, and it's not knocking the song at all. It's not knocking what Green Day did with it, but the production was such that somehow toned down the guitars ever so slightly, Celine Dion or Whitney Houston or even Christina Aguilera could go in and do that song as it stands. And in a way, that possibly is a great compliment to the track because can you ever better the way they did it then? It was serendipity. They seem to capture the moment. And it is probably something that has become such an anthem for Green Day. I would say possibly their most popular song across the mainstream, even more than Basket Case, even more than American Idiot. This is a song that reached out to people and it's been used in so many different areas of mainstream media and TV and commercials because there's something about it it is uplifting, but is very easy on the ear and reaches into people's psyche. While Time of Your Life was a huge hit, Nimrod still failed to buck the trend of Green Day's declining sales. I don't think Nimrod's the best album, but I think it kind of served a purpose at the time. It sort of, you know, there was, it still sold a few million copies, which showed they were doing something right. I mean, if it had been a truly awful record, I don't think it would have sold as well as it did. Uh, again, you know, it didn't sell as well as Dookie, but, um, you know, few bands ever do. It's that Michael Jackson thriller thing, like you're going from, you know, this huge album, and now this one's not doing very well, and then you're going to kind of, when you look at just numbers and figures and singles not hitting top 40, you're going to lose the artistic merit of how this holds up. And if you go back now and listen to that record and, and, and hear how their other ones sound, it, me as a fan, I think it's their best work. Although sales were smaller, Green Day nevertheless retained their loyal fan base, in part through their constant touring and exceptional live performances. When I saw Green Day live, I was blown away. I was a fan of Green Day, and then I saw them live, and I fell in love with Green Day. It was the best concert of my life. They bring heart to what they do. They bring themselves. And, you know, as years go by, you're not going to lose the fact that they're in their record, they're in their music. They're, they're bringing a show that they live and they mean. Seriously, when you guys play, did you like, do you love the audience or do you just love yourself? <laughs> the latter. Yourself. Are you, are you a hot guy or do you just look like it? Both. Billy Joe started performing at the age of seven. The thing that he is, he's a showman. I mean, despite how tight their music is, he works the crowd in such an amazing way. We were 
were doing radio festivals at the time. And so we had a song on the radio. They were doing the Nimrod record. And I remember, I remember being on the side of the stage, standing there next to Dave Grohl and Taylor Hawkins from the Foo Fighters. And um, we were just talking to Matt Pinfield from MTV. And everybody had to stop what they were doing. We left the keg, because Green Day's playing. And it's just like, oh, you know, we caught this show last night. Green Day's playing, and everybody had to walk and stand right there, and, and it's, it's like rock school. It's like you're watching people who not only love to do it, but do it better than anybody else, and you're standing next to members of Nirvana. You're standing next to people who are every bit as, as fortunate and famous, who are just enjoying watching somebody who's living for what they do. Around this time, in the interim between Nimrod and Green Day's next record, the music scene began to see a huge influx of other pop-punk performers, bands such as Blink-182, who were obviously hugely influenced by the Green Day sound. Bands that imitate Green Day and that, who should be paying them royalties, like Blink-182, Sum 41, um, Good Charlotte, I mean, first of all, they should be paying Green Day half of whatever they make, period. I mean, I'm, I don't care how successful Blink-182 was, it was embarrassing to watch. That said, I mean, you could definitely make a case that Green Day should have paid Ramones half of what they made. Obviously, you can't deny the, the Ramones' influence on Green Day. I don't think you can. But they, they took it and they made it their own thing. You know, when you, it's one thing to be influenced by somebody and to be able to hear that influence, but it's another thing to just blatantly just fucking rip them off and just get the same haircut and wear the same clothes. And, you know, this whole hot topic punk generation where it's like they all just look the same. They're all wearing the same skinny tie that they got at Hot Topic. They're all wearing the same baggy black pants with the things that they got at Hot Topic and the same studded belt that they got at Hot Topic and the same this and patches and, you know, it's like do your own thing. No, I'm not, I'm not really a big fan of, of some of those later bands, but, you know, I think it's, a, it's more, I would take it more as flattery. I don't think that they outright stole uh, Green Day sound, in fact, few if any of them are good enough to do that but you know as somebody who helped kind of introduce the that kind of music on a, on a wider basis um, you know I, I find it flattering. While these imitators continued to flourish there would be a three-year gap between Nimrod and its follow-up. Warning hit the shelves in October 2000. This is a public service announcement this is all Warning is a lot more cohesive than Nimrod to me. It's like more of a pop record. It's like, you know, it's like a finely crafted series of songs that maybe aren't as pissed off as Insomniac, but they're just really well put together, well crafted, well written. They're catchy. They cover a decent amount of uh, topics. And it's just a good all around record. The song Warning to me was kind of, you know, it's one of those things where you, you I, I don't know, you just expect it. It was so kind of a, a bland song, you know, it just is that one thing where it did, did well. Rock Radio did well. Uh, I remember putting it on the air. I was, I was working up in high, the high desert. I was the first to play it in, in my area, you know, and at that point I could kind of hear, I had the phones, I kind of wanted to hear what people thought of it. And it, you know, you're like, God, it just sounded so different. Warning is an interesting record. It, it was the album that, in a way, was a crossroads. It almost went back to pop punk, almost as if 
This band had stretched themselves on Nimrod, tried different things and didn't quite know what was going to work and what wasn't and felt so overwhelmed by everything they thought, oh, let's just go back to what we know best. Let's go back and do a pop punk album. There's a bit all over the place with that one. Um, they asked me to, to write the, uh, I guess they call it the bio or the publicity blurb for it. They Express delivery to a copy of the album a day or two before this blurb was was due and I so I basically Listened to the record over and over and over again trying to get a handle on what it was about and Well, and I say I was a bit over, all over the place. I guess the record was too. There was a You know it seemed like they were trying to cover a whole lot of bases and experiment with a whole lot of different sounds With hindsight many have come to see aspects of warning as a trial run for the more political moments of American Idiot, something highlighted by tracks such as Minority. The precursors, as it seems, in um, Warning that may lead into American Idiot are, are almost just an evolution of people growing. You know, again, it's like as an artist, when you, you start in a place and your career is your journey of, of what you're doing. Listen now to Minority, and there's a certain political element to it that they were to take forward. And so there was a germ of something that can move on from there, but they're very good pop punk songs. It proved they could still do it. I interviewed the band um, when they were in the studio rec recording Warning and like Billy Joe told me that up until quite recently he'd been like this sort of weird drunk uncle. He was happy to kind of drink lots of beer and get his clothes off and run around on stage in a leopard print G-string. You can only do that for so long I think and I think he kind of maybe wanted to show that there's this other side to him and that he, w he didn't want to just be kind of remembered as the front man of this kind of wacky geeky, whatever you want to call it, sort of 90s punk band. He wanted to move forward and sustain a career, and I think that's what Warning did quite well. It kind of bridged a, a gap between the pop punk songs and, and the sort of politicised direction that they took. They were pretty passionate about the whole political angle, which was, a, which was a new thing. They had never been a particularly political band. When Dookie was in the final stages of production, they were talking about uh, what, what they would do for the first video. And I said to, to Trey, why don't you do Welcome to, to Paradise? Because it's the, you could get, do some social commentary about the ghetto, and uh, you know, and it's, you know, it's a really infectious and catchy song. But at the same time, you could get credit for, you know, caring about the issues and you know, maybe make some valid social points. And he got this really thoughtful look on his face for for a long minute, and then I said, Yeah, we could do that. No, we'd rather drive a car into a swimming pool. While it contained a couple of successful singles, Warning would unfortunately mark the band's most lukewarm critical and commercial response to date. I think the thing about it, again, is you have a, a good band making good Green Day songs, you know? And so a lot of times people expect, oh, we haven't heard something for a while. They must be coming out with, you know, this great new album. and. They deliver it and people are like, oh, you know, we expected this or we expected that. And I think a lot of times as an artist, it's, it's a little unfair for the critics or, or for people to come at you with their opinion of what you should have done when the whole time it, this, is your, this is your game. It's possibly the moment when Warners came closest to dropping them and saying, enough, let's just get rid of this band. They're never going to do it again. We don't need this sort of thing. We have the back catalogue. Goodbye. After the muted reception of Warning, Green Day's next releases would be Shenanigans, a B-Sides compilation and greatest hits collection, International Super Hits. This ignited worries among fans that Green Day had reached the end of their relevance, now more of a commodity than a band. I do remember thinking, gee, uh, things, things don't look that great if that's what they're doing at the, at the time. But... Um, you know, I was starting to wonder what, what was going to happen.
It proved two points. One, they've written a lot of dang good songs and hit singles. Two, it was almost the end of an era. I think for a lot of bands, certainly going back 10 years, maybe longer, two things marked the end of an era for them, a live album or a compilation, because that was the market which they said, that was then, we're moving on. So now we put together everything which represents that era. Now, that's one way of looking at international super hits. I think it was also a last desperate attempt by Warners to wring out money from the Green Day legacy. At that point, you got to remember, they've influenced bands like the Blinks. They've influenced the newfound glories, and that other pop punk thing has sprouted up now. So Green Day are kind of like elders, you know, elders now. I mean, they, hey, they're great. They, they're respected in that regard. They're kind of getting the props that they they wouldn't have gotten five years earlier. But are they going to be commercially viable anymore? They wanted to buy time. You know, I think that I don't know what the people thought about that. I don't even know what Green Day thought about it, but. With them, it's pretty much their pattern that if they need to take the time, they'll take the time. And I think they were probably really written out after warning and working those hours, because that was still at the time when they were practicing every single day, two to four hours, like it was a job, clocking in the practice place. And I wouldn't be surprised if they do that still to this day, but I think that they just needed time to reinvent because that's so important to them. Rumours abounded that, if Green Day's subsequent albums did not achieve higher sales, the record company intended to put forward the idea of Billy Joe Armstrong branching out as a solo artist. They thought if the, if the record after warning that they anticipated didn't do as well as they expected, they were going to try to reinforce it, that he would become a solo artist. And that the two, I mean, they probably had no plans for the other two, because they thought that he was the golden goose. Just knowing the way that the labels work, that's, that's certainly a possibility. Other artists get dropped for, uh, you know, if their sales keep diminishing. On the other hand, I knew that they had a pretty good relationship with, with their label, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, obviously somebody at the label believed in them enough to, to do a great marketing campaign for American Idiot. Green Day is greater than the sum of its parts. I think Billy's great, I think Trey's great, I think they're all great guys. They could all do their own thing solo, but when you put them together, what you get is something bigger than the sum of the parts. Green Day are obviously kind of three quite different personalities. Um, haven't met them, you kind of, you can observe certain character traits. You know, Billy Joe's seems to be the, the kind of driving force behind the band. He's the guy who seemed to be worrying about the show that night, worrying whether everything was right you know, reading the reviews. He was just, you know, there was things going on. He obviously has an active imagination and kind of steers the band in the direction they go in. As a complete contrast, you've got Trey Cool, who is like an ar archetypal drummer. I think drummers are always mad, you know, a high percentage of them. And he's like this sort of American, this dorky American kid who'd been brought up on too many sort of uh, E numbers in his food, I think. He was a class president. Um, when he was in high school, so he knows the rules, but he knows how to break them. And he breaks musical rules, and he, he breaks personality rules, and there's just this unexpectedness that he will always have in a Green Day show. Mike is a guy who leads with his heart. He is just probably one of the finest people I've, I've ever met in the rock arena. Um, he's all compassion and nerve endings, and every note he plays like he means it. I mean, you can almost see every fiber in his body and his plane. He's so committed, he's so right there, he's so in the moment. It was in 2004 that, apparently against all the odds, Green Day relaunched themselves with a colossally successful American Idiot, an album which fused together all the elements they had been working on for the past decade. American Idiot is, and I've said this on the air before, the greatest album in the history of recorded music. Screw the Beatles, screw even, even, even my personal favorites that, that are above Green Day in the whole scheme of things, American Idiot is a masterpiece. It's the best ever. I'm very critical when it comes to, to records. And when American Idiot first came out, I thought to myself, well, here's gonna be another good Green Day record and that's cool and I'll check it out. And I was totally blown away. I was absolutely blown away.
you just have to look at the band in photos at that time. You know, the release warning, Billy Joe was getting a little bit, a little bit portly and, you know, been drinking a lot of beer, looking a bit flabby, looking a bit tired. If you move forward a few years from Warning to American Idiot, you see a band who are getting kind of lean and hungry and sharp again. I think that's what they were lacking in the, in the late 90s. They were, they were maybe getting a bit complacent. They were thinking, you know, if we stick out a, some half-decent pop-punk songs, it's going to sell. American Idiot was, you know, it's still a pop-punk record, but there's a lot of sort of um, classic rock sounds in there. The problem is that it's a stadium rock album, and... In a way, Green Day had to become a stadium rock band and almost stand for everything they used to stand against to make this album work. So it's an album of contradictions, some great songs on there, and a lot of long pieces that you actually really have to listen to. And it's a very negative album. It's a very angry album. The irony, of course, is that a lot of the people who bought the album in America are exactly those people Green Day were hitting out at. There are these... these left-wing politicians that make me want to pull my hair out. But Green Day, I don't feel that way about, you know? I mean, you know, I... If... I don't see that being political on your album is a negative thing, and I don't see that it's going to cause negative uh, ramifications or negative sales or anything like that. I think that they pretty much wrestled with their demons that bothered them personally. They know who they are now. And in knowing who they are, they know what they're mad at. Johnny Ramone once said that as you get angry, like the Ramones were angry, but in the later part of their career, they were just angrier guys. I mean, I think the same is true of Green Day. They're just angrier guys. With American idiots selling by the millions, many have been asking the same question. Are Green Day's more overlooked albums now long overdue for reappraisal? I think as time goes by, the albums in the middle will just serve as reminders or just further evidence of Green Day as an artist, as a band. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll kind of say, Green Day wasn't just Dookie and American Idiot. It's like, in between there, there's a bunch of great stuff that are, are, are just like additional testaments to how, wh what a great band they are. I don't know what they're, if they want to bury the past or, and move on, um, but I do think that if you're into the band and you want to hear some great, great music in the last 10 years, then you need to rediscover Nimrod and you need to rediscover uh, Insomniac, you know, because if you don't, you know, it's, uh, it's a travesty in my opinion. I think uh, time is often quite good like that. It can, it can uh, iron out any of the faults and you can, it just leaves a band behind who've, you know, released a series of good records. I mean, Green Day sold millions and millions and millions of records and have done for, uh, you know, 10, 12 years now. And I think that's the thing people are going to remember. Mm -hmm.